So the lawyers make us say this. I can't read it. Um, and so let's see. So yeah, so this is broken up into modules. This is actually designed for some sort of being a lab. Um, you know, we may we may run a few of things. So those of you that have laptops, um, how many people actually have have the, the the image booted up and running? One. How many people are trying? How many people are going to try? Going to try. Is there okay. a place we can download this? I don't have not people drive. Uh, I believe so. If you search, what? Yeah, I think if you search for Silk Live CD, maybe add the word search, maybe add the word Netza, you can get it. I tried that, and I didn't come up with the 3.0 image. So do you know the 3.0 image is, or how to find that? It shouldn't, uh, the commands will still work. Yeah, yeah, it'll probably be okay. And I, I think it's the same data set, so it'll probably be all right. Cool. Um, all right, so at the end of this module, you will be able to... Um, Know what the major pieces of silk are. Um, retrieve flows use, using the RW filter command. RW filter is sort of the workhorse. Um, does anybody not? Well, we'll, we'll just go through this. Um, um, yeah, be able to do, use basic silk commands and count and, and profile networks using. Okay, so really, what I'd like to get through is um, you know the, the, so, sort of the three workhorse commands that we've got, and and we'll try and we'll try and do this interactive. Um, all right, so network flow, silk, right, we've got this. All right, so, um, you know, this is the, the first statement here is sort of a subjective statement. Is, is optimized for extremely large data collections. Do we, they, they, do you, do you have, can you put any quantity on large here? I, 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 I don't have the, like, the numbers memorized. Oh, what do you mean? Sorry. Well, it's just, so it says silk is optimized for extremely large data collections. I mean, um, like, um, like DOD wise, or even every every one of their transactions since they started business. Yeah, it's yes. All, uh, yeah. Everything's stored in a binary format, and it's large scale. I think we have most of the DOD network, um, which is DOD one of the largest like networks in the world, um, and we run so. Yeah, so I, 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 I can't give you know, like numbers of records. I know that we've got data for. Uh, um, our oh, customers back, you know, sort of ten years, years or so. Okay. Um, the basic so format, the basic it. format is a binary format. I think it's about fifty-three bytes uncompressed. It's, a, it's essentially a fixed format, and I think it compresses down to something like thirteen bytes per record, right? And so yeah. this is actually one of the things about Silk, or about flow data in particular, um, is that you know you can since it compresses, you know, I, I think I figured at one point there's about like about a thousand to one compression ratio from from full packet. Um, you know, this is just memory from a while back. Uh, but, you know, you can store the stuff for a long time. So if you want to do, um, you know, retrospective analysis, if you want to store stuff, if you want to have some idea what happened three years ago, and you can't keep your P caps, right? Silk and flow in particular will help you with that. Uh, so there is a command line, it is a command line interface. That's why I asked about the Unix tools, right? Um, this was, it's, it's now about 10 years old. Well, yeah, it's, it's Silk is a little over 10 years old. There is a gearway. Yeah, there's a thing called Pi Silk. You know, it's there. It's there, and uh, what it does is when you click on buttons, it writes the command at the bottom. Yeah. You can copy and paste and throw it in the command line, or you can run a segregated database. Yeah, it, 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 it's at the end. It, it, it's a it's a classic. You know, have command line will wrap with with, with UI um, yeah, application. Um, but anyway, so this was written about ten years ago by people who love you know cut prep said off. Um, you know, who love working on the command line. Um, and we've actually gotten a lot of mileage out of that. So, you know, it takes the Unix philosophy of, well, except for RW, RW filter, it takes the Unix philosophy of doing one thing well and then chaining things together. We'll, we'll, we'll probably, hopefully we'll get to see that a little bit later. And I think I've already sort of talked to this, you know, really the best, the, the thing it's best for is retrospective analysis, right? Looking at things after the fact. So, you know, you get an IDS alert. Right, and you know, it, it says that you know, you know, bad guy on this this block list, you know, tried to talk to me. Well, you know, how long has he been trying to talk to me? How far back did any of the guys inside my network ever actually answer? Right. So it's really good for, um, or you know, you have some mal you have a, a you know a malware infection, and you know, for some some way or another, you you know what the call out addresses of it are. Right. Now, if you've got flow for your network, right, the inside of your network. 
you know, you could ask questions like, okay, well, I know that, you know, my HR department was infected and it called out to the, the CDC, right? Now I'm going to go over to, you know, engineering and, and see, you know, who's doing the call out and then, you know, you can, you can work back with your remediation and that sort of thing. So it's really good for that. Um, report generation, yeah, if you like text, if you like, you know, text oriented reports. Um, yeah, and then what happened, you know, what led up to an incident. So we can do that for those sorts of things. Um, yeah, so this is the basic sort of collection, you know, high level collection architecture, right? So, you know, you've got a minimum of one sensor. Um, in our world, there's a thing called GAF. Um, it could be a Cisco router. The Cisco routers, or, you know, pretty much any, any networking device for the last 10, maybe 15 years, will, you know, yeah, um, any networking device for about the last 15 years will, will export flow. And so, you know, whenever there's a connection through the router, whenever, you know, whenever one starts or stops, the routers will send it out. Uh, there is this funny little thing about network engineers that they think that routers are for passing packets and anything else, right, is, is a waste of cycles and memory and they don't want to do it, right? So, you know, you can get started that way and it's a nice sales, sales point on Cisco's, you know, Jennifer's, um, you know, little brochure that they do, they do NetFlow export. But, you know, try and get a network engineer with a router peg to 80% to do it. You know, so that's why we wrote, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons we wrote YAF, yet another flow meter. Um, and, you know, then you stick that on the span or the tap, um, you know, and then, then it watches the packets and generates the flow. Um, in a, well, there's two, two basic varieties of flow. There, there's the, the Cisco V5 stuff, which has been out since, like, the late 90s. And then there's the IP fix stuff, which has been standardized through the IETF. Um, uh, give the time I'll just go over it. Um, so you have one or more sensor connected someplace. It dumps records in the silk repository, and then then the terminal is zero. Uh, can, I do, can I do that? That's a pointer. Um, yeah, perfect. Here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So one or more sensor dumps records in your silk repository. Those 53 bytes compressed down, compressed to like 15 or whatever bytes, and then then you use the command line stuff to get at it. That's the GUI. That's iSilk is what is what's called the GUI. Um, that has not seen you know truth in lending. That has not seen very wide deployment or or, or or adoption. You know most of the work that really gets that people get done is over here. So you know I, I did say that if you don't aren't using the command line and you want to learn silk. Use the GUI, and when it writes the commands at the bottom, that can help you know what you're, how you're, yeah. it helps you structure them in the correct mm -hmm. format. It, it, it could be it could be a help. It could be a helper. Right. Um, so I've just heard. I haven't heard really positive things about that. Truth no. in, truth in, in, you know, don't people, don't put that on the video. No, okay, <laughs> <don't do that. laughs> we'll, we'll cut that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So that's it. And then the question becomes, one of the questions becomes, you know, where is that sensor or where are those sensors, right? You know, those could, you, you, you know, the, the, the classic place to put that is on, you know, your uplink. If you have a small organization with one or two uplinks to the internet, right, you put it there, preferably, you know, inside so that, you know, inside the firewall, maybe you're inside the screening router or whatever you've got, so that, you know, at least some of the cruft is done. You know, you can go wild, you can go wild with these and put them, you know, on every switch and, you know, every switch and, and link inside your network and have full internal visibility. But most people, you know, will put this on, on the edge of their network, you know, so they know the inside outside. Silk is actually very oriented towards the idea of inside and outside. So the design is actually, you know, showing a little bit of its age, right, because, because it, it really believes that there is, you know, inside and outside. Um, that's a concept which I think yeah. is getting weaker than it used to be. So, um, if when you if you do set it up, it's important to when you do the configs to specify what's in, inside outside because that changes when you do run a command. It's a, it changes in and out. Yeah. So. So we'll we'll go through these slides a little bit later. There's actually a slide which talks about sort of you know why you would want to use Silk, right? So it sort of motivates this. But I'm going to actually go through the slides just kind of in the order they are because <coughs> that's where they are. Um, I, I might have reordered these, but I'm, I'm not. Um, can I get yes? Um, water. Um, all right. So, um, 
All right, this 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 is the ba this is the basic you know packet encapsulation diagram. Um, you know, so basically, you know, in a, in a, a quote normal network, you'll have your Ethernet frame, right? You'll have IP inside of that, your layer three, and then you'll have TCP as a transport inside of that, and then the applications will be sort of inside of that. That'll, that'll be sort of your layer seven. Silk rides almost entirely um, in sort of the green and the orange here, sort of at the layer three and four, right? So silk is pretty much all about you know, source and destination address, source and destination port, maybe number of, number of bytes, um, you know, maybe your TCP flags, right? It doesn't, for instance, you know, extract HTTP headers. It doesn't really do, doesn't give you a lot of DPI. Um, um, it will, I think, in a couple cases, give you some layer two information. You know, it'll, it'll, I think it may actually go down there, but that pretty much self-rides there. If you want to contrast that with bro, there, because yes, said the word, you want to contrast that with Bro, and I believe Argus, there they Bro will Bro will go all the way up the stack of seven and extract layer seven and red. Do you guys get layer two stuff out? Not yet. I'm working on that. Okay. Argus is is really, really all about everything from layer two up, right? Um, so that was the, those were some of the other tools that we were talking about this week. Um now, yeah, for the thing I told you about that does the, the collection uh, that we wrote will actually, it, it actually gets the whole packet, right? And, and based on that, it's actually able to extract, uh, hello, hello. Um, there, there are handouts, and if you have a machine, there's a VM that you can boot, and, uh, um, and you didn't miss the motivation slide, so we're just going into all the details, and then we'll make the motivation. Um, Oh, you something. Yeah. So YAF will YAF will extract you know some some layer seven information. I believe you know DNS replies. Correct, guys. Correct me if I'm wrong. You have to turn it on. Uh, yeah. Not by so it's like, what what are some of the things? What are some of the layer seven things that YAF so, does? Uh, it does like header information. So uh, say RTP packet it chooses it or SIP right. So SIP is in clear text. It just it will it will go far enough in the packet to notify that this is the protocol SIP, and then it will label that flow as SIP. Just like it's, it's yeah. like metadata. Yeah. So the one thing that does come in, so so when I said GAF will collect the layer seven stuff, and IP fix the, the 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 newer format, you can actually embed that stuff and send it. You know, so all the you know some of the you know the HTTP headers and DNS names that sort of stuff can be in an IP fix packet. It doesn't fit in a, in a in a in a V five packet. There's just no way to put it in there. Silk was written pretty much for, for at V five. Right, so what happens then is YAF will collect it, it sends the IP fix record, and then the thing which takes takes it off the wire and, and makes it available to the self repository, you know, essentially strips out everything but the, the source destination, you know, bytes, flags, that's that sort of information. The one thing that will be preserved is this thing called app label. And uh, this is this is a little um, the app label, it, the app will try to make a guess, you know, based on regular expression or parsing <coughs> protocol as to whether something looks like HTTP or FTP or SMTP. So, you know, it, 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 let's say it looks like SSH, right? It'll give it an app label of 22, right? That 22 does not necessarily mean that it's the you know port number, you know, port number 22, but it's it's just a, it's just a label for it uses the standard number as a label. So you you might get um, some traffic on port 80, which, you know, it's actually SSH, and the label will be 22, right? So, you know, that's one, the one place you get layer 7 information in, in the self repository. Right? Then you can actually, you know, do a bit of anomaly detection, right, based on that. So, you know, Bro has its, has its weird logs, and, you know, this is the one place where, where in Silk you can, you can actually find some, some sort of oddities. Actually, there's a lot of places you can go with flags. Um, so, um, another thing to understand about flows, particularly the, the V5 and the way Silk does flows, is they are unidirectional. Okay, um, Argus and I believe Bro puts things back together, and so like you know, a connection has data going one way and going the other way. Well, you know, Silk just basically does what the V5, the Cisco V5 stuff does. So when you make a you know a TCP connection, let's call it an SSH login, right? That's a flow going out, right? You know, high port. Port 22, that's a flow coming back. Port 22, back to your high port. It's, it's two, right? And you know this 
you know, so to put those back together, so for instance, to know that there were, um, you know, uh, the ratio of bytes out to, to bytes in was 100 to 1, right, that's not, that's not one of the easier things to do in Silk, so that's, that's just something that, you know. Um, so this, this diagram basically just shows, you know, the order of things and, the, and how the patterns are. So this top one would the C, you would have a flow coming in, um, you know, you would have you would have packets coming in one way and packets going out the other way, and you know they would be in separate flows. Uh, so I sort of talked about this, um, yeah. And so in, in in the TCP world, right, some of the things that you want to look at are are the, the, the SYN, the SYN act, and the, and, the, and the act. And um, in silk, um, this is a, in silk, you, you can get the flags, the initial flag. <coughs> Right, which is the flags in the first byte of the packet. So if it's a SIN, a TCP, a beginning of a TCP connection, it'll have a SIN. Right, you can get the aggregate flags. So if if it's a if it's a, um, a complete connection, you'll probably see you know SIN, ACK, and reset, and maybe maybe another another flag or two. So doing flag analysis actually is can tell you things like you know was this somebody trying to do a scan? You know the classic old SIN scan. Right, where it's just single byte, you know, single byte TCP connection attempts with nothing but the same flag set, you know, going, you know, going to every port. Right, so you can you can actually tell if it's a scan attempt. Um, you know, you can actually tell if, if, if there's a, you know, like a Christmas tree packet where they set up where they lit up everything. You can do a bit of anomaly detection, you know, uh, just by look, by looking at the flags. Uh, but you just need to be aware that <coughs> those are there and that it's you know, directional. Uh, one yeah. thing I want to add real quick. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not involved in the SOAP team, but I'm a heavy SOAP user. One of the things I hear often when we talk about the flows... Just a second. Being, I, I, I was not able to hear it over the... the, the uh, one of the things when people talk about flows being you know, bi-directional, whether you know, both directions is one flow or two flows, a lot of times people will misinterpret and say that the fact that it's a single direction is a flow, so for one connection you actually have two flow records. A lot of people will think that's a shortcoming of SOAP, and I think that's a common misconception. Uh, because in, in most arenas, and I think especially network security monitoring uh, from a defensive perspective, analysis is aided dramatically by having those flows separated. Um, so, I, and I just want to add that as a, something from my experience, and I think Jason over there will, will agree that those being separated is actually a benefit and not, and, and there are reasons behind that. It's not just a limitation of software. Well, go, go for it, because like, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I can make the case, and I'm I'm, yeah. you know, I'm willing to take all, all input, including. Yeah, you know, and, and I wish, I wish I had <laughs> examples I could give to, to show. Uh, but you know, a lot of people when we're discussing like Silk versus Argus, they'll say, oh, Argus because the, the communication streams are together. And um, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy that the less abstraction from the real data, the better. Um, the more you can see what's actually going sure. on. Um, when, when an application puts two flow, flow directions together, it's making assumptions uh, sometimes, and there's some programmatic logic that goes into that. And depending on who's doing that or how that's done, it might always might not, not always sync together properly. <coughs> so when you're seeing those separated, you're less abstracted from the data, um, and that's really a key when you're doing especially low-level um, network security monitoring activities. So I see that as a strength of Silk, and one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of it, as opposed to some of the competing uh, technologies. I'd say a lot of the, uh, the usefulness of all this is how actual is your data in the first place. And not every say a sock, not every sock has you know every single analyst being a uh, you know, to be truthful, they're not always uh, you know, perfect. I mean, you have senior level and then you have junior level people, and a lot of times bi-directional data like like Argus presents is sometimes confusing when they think, okay, well, you know, I know how naturally I see traffic. Well, it's more natural kind of seeing how Silk presents it than how Argus presents it. And when you show them that, they get a better understanding and come onto it faster. Because I know we've, we've presented Argus and Silk actually here in yep. Charleston and over at uh, Spade Ward. Okay. to a lot of analysts and silk comes off you know, just like that. I'm like, oh yeah, get it completely. But sometimes, they're not hating on Argus, because Argus is great too, but yeah. they don't completely <laughs> get Argus right off the bat. And the the whole learning curve of all that to be an issue. Yeah. All right, so I'm not going to argue with success, and you guys are making a case that, that you know, I think is a great case. I will tell you that I personally have spent a lot of time fighting flows back together and that we have a tool in the tool suite whose job is to put them back together and you know sure. there's analysis that you can do in fact we had a we had a talk at, at silk uh, or at, uh, at flowcon yesterday day before the pcr uh, yeah. where they were talking about um carter in fact was talking the, the guy where argus was actually talking about um 
producer-consumer relationship, is what he called it. And so then what they were looking at was the, the ratio, in fact, what I talked about earlier, is the ratio of bytes out to bytes in. Right, and they're, you know, so like a web server, for instance, right, you know, should be a small connection going in, the classic, you know, web page, right, should be a small connection going in, big thing comes back, that's normal, you know, that, that, that goes along for weeks, and then, you know, then the ratio changes around, you know, what's going on there, right, so, you know, it's just a question of what you want to do. Um, all right, so I should probably go through some of these slides, it's questionable how many exercises we're actually going to do, but we'll just keep going. Um, so what is in a record? I've already talked about this. You know, the fundamental thing that is in a record is what is called the five tuple, right? So a flow is fundamentally defined in SILK by the source address, the destination address, the source port, the destination port, and the protocol, right? And, um, you know, so that would be, you know, my home, you know, or, you know my phone, Talk to a web server, opens a connection, and it's each got a source, it's got a destination, the ports, and then the protocol. And of course, you can get collision on that based on time. You know, you, know, you, you might want to add time for, for disambiguation, right? Because if I make the same connection, you know, and the ephemeral port doesn't change, you, know, you can get collisions there. But that's fundamentally what defines a flow. Um, so the source port, or in the case of ICMP, you've got the message type code, uh, protocol bytes. Uh, yeah, so we, we have byte counts, how many bytes were transmitted in this flow. Um, you have the initial flags and the and the, the, all the flags that are seen. So the, the, the flags that were in the first packet and then all the flags that were sort of handed together, or, or together, um, yeah, sorry, or together, across, across all of them. Um, the start and the stop time, um, you often get the sensor ID, so if you have multiple sensors, it's sometimes useful to know if it was, you know, the Charleston router versus the San Diego router or whatever. Um, you can know how the condition, how the flow terminated. So, you know, if it's just a short-lived, happy, you know, TCP connection with the, you know, with a fin or a reset, right? Uh, a normal TCP connection. That's one way for it to close. Uh, if if they run longer than I believe it's 30 minutes is the default, right? Um, rather, you know, so the problem you have is, let's say that somebody opens a connection to, you know, uh, Antarctica was the favorite, the favorite bad country. We've stopped, for some reason, apparently we've stopped saying China is bad. Now Antarctica is the bad country. So let's say that you have a three-week TCP connection, you know, to Antarctica. Well, the way the routers work, I mean, uh, the way React would work, would they would they would just kind of hold on to that, and you know you would find out three weeks later when the connection closed normally, right, that there was a connection. Well, that's not really you know for analysis, you know you might want to know that there's an ongoing long-term connection. So the the uh, the routers and YAF will will do an, what's called an active timeout, right? So they'll chop, and I believe it's a 30 minute, uh, 1800 seconds. It's uh, idle timeout 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, idle and active. So idle is like if a flow record doesn't close, like, like it doesn't see any more records going by. If it, so, an active is like they still see packets being passed. Yeah. Right, and then it closes the record. Yeah. And idle says, "Oh, I haven't seen packets for thirty minutes. I'm going to break this up." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. sometimes you don't see like a return from the TCP, like a sync or a close of a connection. It just it because they don't set up their web server or whatever correctly, it just stays open. And the idle timeout after thirty minutes will close it. And if the Information's been going on for longer than like an hour or something like that, an active time will close the record, right? And then it'll start a new flow. Yeah, but the point is, if something's going on yeah, for a exactly. long time, you know, you, just for analysis, you might want to know what's happening. Which is a, a fun thing from an analyst perspective when you have a new analyst and they're looking at flow data and they see here are 20 connections from the same host that are exactly 30 minutes long. Oh yeah. my god, it's malware, it's beaconing back. No, that's just the <laughs> In fact, I wrote a beacon detector, and uh, you know, one of the first things I, you know, I had to do put in documentation was, you know, these thirty-minute things look like beacons all the time. Well, here's a way. Here's a way to filter those out, right? Um, now, of course, if you're being if you're being a sneaky beaconer, right, then you beacon right on thirty minutes. Yeah, we'll around thirty minutes. You, pass, you, pass, you know, you can't win. It's an arms race. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. See what's there. Um, in case it wasn't clear, each record represents a flow. Unless you do uh, lower your item time off the Okay. I'm hoping you can at least get some information. Uh, 
so here's you know what a DNS uh, query and response might look like in Wireshark, right? So it looks like 105, 1105 is sending to that 10 address, um, 78 bytes, and you're doing a query, comes back, you get a response. Um, so that looks pretty standard, and then um, you know you can see the layering. Um, you know you can see you can see the the Ethernet frame, the the, the IP, the layer three, <coughs> the layer four, and then you know the, the, then if you were to expand that out, you start seeing all the layer seven stuff which comes in there. Um, right. So there's a sequence diagram. Right. So there's you know the request, the response. Let's see. Okay. So Here's our first actual look at silk output. So I believe we're looking at the same thing here. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we're looking at the same thing there that we were looking back at the uh, at the, the Wireshark. Um, and so this is this is going to be the output of RW cut, right? And so th this this format will be the one you get get very friendly with if you start working with silk, right? So you've got the source, the destination, the port, you know, packet, uh, number of bytes. There's your sensor type, you know, you can configure that when you set up silk, and then there's type, and we'll get to that later. There's in, out, in web, out web, um, the, external to external. There's about six types. Right. The, the type, that's why the, in setting up a silk config is so important, because that auto labels the type. So what you have to know what's inside the boundary, outside the boundary, and when you query, that's what it says in and out. Otherwise, you can you can have the DNS of the in and in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, yeah. but there's out, in and out, right, which are pretty obvious, right? So, you know, so because I said Silk is very, very, it believes very deeply in having an inside and outside of your network topologically. It, it's kind of really built into Silk, um, whether that makes sense or not. Um, but there's also in web and out web. Which basically just segment out the 8443 and a couple other ports into um, so the silk the silk storage is actually just a directory. It doesn't use a database. It actually uses just a hierarchy of directories, right? So yeah, I believe oh, we'll get the I believe you have like the sensor name, the year, the month, the day, right? And you know goes down goes down like that. And just just because there's so much more web traffic than anything else, there's a separate type for for web, in web and out web. And that just gets shunted off to, to keep, you know, to keep the the large traffic sort of out of the way. Um, all right. So here is a sequence. Uh, this is your your DNS query. All right. So what this is showing is that sensor placement matters, right? So um, what you what you see is going to depend upon where your sensor is placed. Um, mm -hmm. Go to the next one, right? Here's um, what may be more realistic. So if you're here, right, outside the NAT, right, everything's going to look like one address coming out, right? If, you're, if you don't have the NAT, then you're actually going to see the, you know, the source address from the query. Um, so that's, that's, that, that's a key thing to think about and to understand is where your sensors are placed, particularly relative to NATs, right? Particularly relative to NATs and proxies. Um, um, all right, so let's take a look at this. So, so someone, uh, someone, tell me what, what we're seeing here. Someone walk walk through this in, in, in lieu of in lieu of uh, maybe doing diet, doing uh, labs because it's going to be too short. Um, someone, someone, someone who you know maybe new to this, walk through this and tell me what we're looking at. <coughs> so, what's this? It's got an outbound DNS request and response. Right. And then what are we looking at here? Outbound HTTP request, probably. Yeah. Right. And so, who, who's who's doing who's doing the requesting in both cases? The 192 address. Yeah, the 192 address. So he goes he goes you know out to the DNS server, gets a response from the DNS server, and then goes out to the uh, the address. I believe we we'll go back to the the, the, um, the Wireshark. I think that's the same address set. Um, You'll also see um, in this one. So this was, a, you know, out and in, right? So it's, the types were labeled. Um, you know, depending, assuming you have your it's all configured correctly. And then because this was port 80, right? This just put it in the out and out web buckets, right? And when you do the filtering, um, which I'm really hoping we get to the filtering, 
um, you know, you can filter on any one of these, right? The workhorse tool of Silk is called an RW filter, and that basically lets you pick records out of the repository based on, you know, pretty much any combination of these that you want. So if you wanted to see the, uh, you know, if you wanted to see only the web traffic, um, you know, you could you could just select the out web stuff or the port 80 stuff. Um, you'll also see that we see flags here, okay? Um, so. So someone, you know, and anyone, to take take a stab at telling me what these what these flags are doing. So I've I've told you we've got initial flags, right, which is the flags in the first packet, and then this is the or, yeah, the or of all the flags together. So why we have just an S an S there? What, what's that telling us? Sent from the client. Sent from the client, and so can anybody tell me what 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 these might be? The S R P A. That means during the during the flow during during right? this during this flow <coughs> not in the record like you're saying not for packet right but the during the whole flow we right. saw sin reset push and hack is what that says right, right. Yeah. okay so is does this look like a complete connection you can actually tell sort of tell from the flags well the the reset doesn't look so hot well I mean why not <coughs> uh, you, you you set the reset you close down the packet and then you. So you're going to have a sin, right? Um, there's going to be some acts, obviously, if you have a complete connection. Um, the push, you know, that's neither here nor there. I mean, that's just that's just the prioritization thing. But the reset is telling me, I believe, that you've got a complete, you know, a, a complete connection. This looks pretty normal. And then the in the in web, well, okay, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to walk I'm not going to walk through. So, but then so this was a sin and a sin act right on the first two packets. Right. So anyway, I'm just throwing this stuff out here so you can see that it's there, right? And and you know you can do some weirdness detection on that. And David, I think I think or, uh, I think what you might have been thinking is um, you look for the fin, right? And so yeah. for perspective, expect a fin, uh, fin act sequence. But yes. but in actual real implementation, a reset kind of will work a lot. Yeah, this is I think a lot of websites. This, this is sort of the this is sort of the rude way to do it, right? Yeah. The, the nice way is see that, and I think you get maybe get an yeah. So yeah. This, that, this, that's, this that's a reset that's coming from the client to the server, though. Yeah, because the server maybe just stops responding. Yeah, so yeah. Fair enough. enough. I'm just saying it doesn't look normal to me. Yeah. I would expect and per perspective. Act, perspective right? Perspective is definitely not everything was happy. You look right, at but it. Look at enough web servers, they all, a lot of them don't send the fit back. Yeah. You don't get the F back. You just get a, you mess the time, you get a reset because it's fine. So our web server sends you information and stops sending you. Yeah. Perspective and valid and sends a reset. Yeah. Okay, but you guys are starting to get into it, right? You know, so this is this is where Silk leads you is into looking at stuff like this and seeing what you can figure out, right? Um, okay, HTTP sequence. Uh, so you've got the client, you've got the server, you've got the DNS server. So he sends a response. Get the, the, okay, the whole sequence there. Um, all right, so what are we looking at here? <coughs> what are we looking at here? Um, yeah. I think I heard it. It's our email. Yeah. yeah. So you've got this guy talking to port 25, although it's not modern mail, it's, it's an old send mail, but it's not, it's not Gmail. Um, <laughs> you've got that. And what's this? 19? Hmm? Remember the last line? Yeah. <coughs> A, a single reset. Right. So why is it not a part of the initial flow? Yes, that was a question. That was a question I had as well, um, and I'm, I'm not sure I got the answer. That should have. That should have been. Well, the initial, initial flow is also reset, right? So the initial flow is closed when the client's on reset. Okay. So so this guy closed down. So mm -hmm. Yaf apparently thought could have been out of sequence. Yaf apparently thought, thought, thought we're done, out. but for some reason the, the guy decided to send uh, send another one. And so we got a new flow. Hmm. Okay. Received out of sequence or a duplicate, something or other. Yeah, yeah. But gotcha. try and understand this stuff. Um, all right. So, oh, by the way, these slides are on the, uh, the 2012 um, uh, Flowcon website. So if you just go to the, the training, the, the archives of it's flow without the W, flowcon.org, go to the archives for 2012. Ron, these slides are up there, so you can get these. Um, all right, so what are we looking at here? Okay, so what protocol have we got here? What was the reason? reason? IP protocol number one. Is that ICMP? Uh, I believe that is ICMP. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take uh, 
Okay. Uh, okay. So who's doing the sending? Yeah, that one fifty five. Yeah, one fifty five is doing the sending. Who's he sending to? Different people. Everybody. All over the place. How many packets? And, and how many how, how many packets? Always two. Always two. How many bytes? Always two. Okay, divide that out. What do you got? 61. Right. Because oh, so he's sending pings, probably. Echo requests. Yeah, something like that. Uh, uh, okay, so, so how many bytes in the TCP header? Or how many bytes in the, in the IP header? 20. 20. 20. Right. Um, and, uh, getting deeper than, than uh, 20. And so you've got beyond that. Okay. Um, anyway. Yeah, th this, is, this is the idea of how, how far apart are these guys going. So it looks like, what, seven seconds? Uh, oh, wait. It varies. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So it does let you allow show for ICMP. Hmm? It tells you the ICMP number. There's a, you can, uh, the type. The type of the code. Type, yeah. Sorry, the type, type and code. code. Yeah. The type and code. Yeah, you can. But we don't have that. We don't have those in here. I guess just for the size of the display. And can, you, can you elaborate on S time versus just time? Start time. Start time. Okay. So start time. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's an eating. This is that time. So. Right. And then there's, there's a duration. There's a duration. So you know, could be redundant. All right. Let's see what we're looking at here. <laughs> what are we looking at here? Let's see how we're doing all the time. Web traffic again. Okay, so this guy is sending 80 to here, so okay. Um, and looks like that's a reply, 480 reply. Packets seem balanced. Number of bytes coming back is okay. So is this what you would expect or not expect on a sort of classic web server? Yeah. Little okay. bits, big replies. Okay. Uh, fin, sin, push, act. You're not seeing the reset. Um, oh, you're seeing the fin though, so you're good. Um, all right. So what? What's the rest of this? Um, so it's looking like okay, more of the same. So it looks like he's just getting a bunch of web pages from the same guy every time. Same guy, same reply. So this is looking like just a bunch of web pages coming back. I mean, anybody seen anything else? And so the reason these are different flow records is because they represent different connections, TCP connections. Yeah, because right? you have the, you have the, <coughs> the, the, the connection on the hour. Right. right. Okay. So then, it's like different can, source words. Right. So you're right. Because they're different connections. Okay, gotcha. And you could probably make the assumption by looking at this that whatever the operating system is, it sends it, it uses sequential source ports for generating requests because the two that were sent. So it's not Linux. Yeah, the two that were sent at 11 were just you know, old ports 936 and 4093 and 4093 and the one set of 12 were yeah. yeah, and in fact a number of years ago, a guy that doesn't work at CERN anymore actually did some work on this you know, on the source port numbers to do to do like operating system identification. Yeah. Um, there was another thing you could do to find out whether somebody's behind um, a very busy, I think, proxy. Yeah. Right? Because then what's gonna happen is there's there, A, there's gonna be some pattern of assignment. You know, in the in the, in the high ports, but there's then with a very busy proxy, you're actually going to see a wrap. You know, you're actually going to see these numbers wrap, and so he actually put up sort of a you know a, a chart showing showing the wrap. You know, so you know, and the reason that's that's relevant for for folks is when you have sequential source ports like that, you can sometimes make some ones up that. Yeah, but based on the assignment, you know, you can actually fingerprint sometimes. You know, what it is. Um, so, you know, it's sparse data, but you can do a lot of inference. You can find a lot of stuff just from inference. Um, let's see where we're going now. Okay. So, timing, yeah, this is what, I think we're starting to get into what you were talking about, the active timeout, the, the flush, the idle. Right. So, I think we already sort of talked about this. Um, yeah, I've already sort of talked about this. These are historically the types. I think maybe the ICMP one might be gone. But, anyway, these are the, ba the basic types. Um, I think the ICP one is gone because they made a new command for that to show the Yeah, this is this this is silk too, right? This is a little bit older. But the really the really big ones are the in, out, in web, out web, 
um, if you if you set this up on your home network and just completely fail to to configure the addresses in, in sensor.com, you know, all your traffic is going to look like external to external traffic. If you have everything correctly configured and you're seeing external to external traffic, one possibility is that you're providing transit to somebody and you might not want to be doing that. Um, but uh, and then also, you know, you might see internal to internal traffic depending upon your configuration. Yeah. So, and maybe you'll, you'll get to this, but how, how, how does the aggregation happen across multiple sensors? Where if you're getting data from multiple places, does it get aggregated into, well, you know, I saw this here and here, but this was a single connection. It doesn't. And what happened? Much. It doesn't. It, it, the record comes in, the, the, the silk record comes in, it gets written to the repository, and, you know. The yeah. sensor name is tagged in there, so you don't come with different sensors. So, yeah, I was just wondering if different sensors had different images of what was internal and external. How you don't uh, that, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, they can be, they, they can be, configured. sensor.com does yes. that? Yes, sensor.com, so each sensor, well, depending, because like, you have different boundaries and right. you have different subnets and networks, so then, you have this boundary and this sensor, you would, uh, where the sensor is placed, and what monitor traffic is monitoring, that's what you have to send in and out, and the sensor over here, you just send in and out, but the sensor repository will both see them as in, right, uh, when, it, when you query, and then uh, it will be, you're going to get different flows, you know, they're not going to, Combine them, right? But when you query them, if you look at sensor one and two, and some, you can even specify the sensor that you want to look at if you want to. Yeah, that's that sensor. So yeah, you do the query, they'll come up as two different. Uh, yeah, no, so you can, okay. like if you do a query for whatever IP, right? Mm -hmm. You can see if it went through sensor one or sensor two. Um, and the, the best way I find it is to is to uh, line it up by time, right? Start by start time, and then you can see if the it's a fun sensor when you have like you know five or six sensors you can you look at those flow records and they're sequential and based on the subtle difference in the time you can see things moving through the network yeah. um, and it's very logical to follow which makes our fun analysis okay so I'm going to do a check here I'm going to stop in 15 minutes because that'll be an hour right um, I'm going to attempt to at least get to the why you might want to use flow slide which I think is later I would have put it first um, I'm going to try and get to the, this is what the, the basic filter command looks like, this is what the cut command looks like, this is what the sort, you know, the, the, the stats command looks like, because I think those are important. And then I will, um, I don't know if I have network connection here, there's a, I think your book actually has a thing about how to download and install Silk, right? Yeah, I was going to, when you were done, I was going to tell people where to find the guides, like y'all's guides and the one I wrote for security. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Okay, so is then I will... Is there sample data on the live feed? Yes, there is. Flash data? Um, flash data, thanks. May, okay, okay, in addition to that, I will try and run one or two live commands. So let's just see if 15 minutes gets us there. Um, okay, we've talked about that. Ah! This is the this is the yes yes and if I were a good presenter and I would I would have I would have known my slides and because, but I haven't presented this for about a year so I don't know the sequence of my slides. Um, so this 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 is the, uh, the the why you might want to use Silk and what does it do for you. Um, so what's on my network right? Situational awareness. You know the network engineers might think that they have you know um, these address blocks and the web guys might think that they have five servers but really there's six. Um, you know, when you look at a network, quite often you find out things that, you know, the people who, who you know, sat at the meetings and said, you know, this is, this verily, this is what we designed, right? No, verily, you know, this is what's on my network, right? This is, this is one of the things that just looking at your network, you know, is good for, right? And then you can tell them, and maybe it's a configuration error, and maybe, you know, maybe it's a box that got left there 15 years ago and, you know, was still running, you know, whatever. It's good for that. Um, what happened before the event? Okay, so, you know, typical thing, IDS alert, you know, infection, um, you know, power outage, you know, whatever you've got. You know, what was going on, you know, what was going on before that, what was going on after that. So it gives you history, right? Um, policy violations. <coughs> policy violations. Um, is everybody really supposed to be going through the, the internal you know, proc, uh, DNS proxy. Oh, are there, are, you know, are, are people going straight out to the root name server? I mean, that, that's a fairly benign one, right? Um, are the firewalls, you know, is everybody supposed to be going through, you know, the, the web proxy, but, you know, really, you know, there's this firewall over here or this router over here is letting people do things that's outside. So you could find policy violations with flow. It's actually fairly easy. Um, where are they occurring? Um, you know, 
a lot of one of, one of the most popular websites, DNS servers by byte, by connections during the day, after you know, you can do a lot of that kind of stuff. Just what you know, what's being used. And, and you know, again, I think one of the big values of this is actually building up your understanding of your network, right? Because then that enables, you know, this this is the, the that enables you to say, you know, in, in an ad hoc way, you know, this is an anomaly, this isn't right. I think bro, right? This is one of the things that I see about Bro is, is it, it lets you at least the, you know it lets you understand right that's that's really one of the big values is, is understanding what's on your network it's whether it's Bro or Argus or Silk or you know a commercial tool understanding what's on your network is, is the first step. Um, okay, uh, right. So you know if I put in this blacklist, you know if I dropped all social media things, you know how much how much traffic would I drop? Um, irrespective of how many people would be, uh, you know, mad and how quickly would the executives tell you to turn it back on? That's a different question. Um, let's see, do my users go to known effects? So, yeah, you know, get get down your favorite, um, you know, malware list, your favorite, you know, <coughs> emerging threats, your favorite whatever, and, you know, ask, are my people going there, right? Good to know. Uh, are there spammers? Okay, maybe not so much anymore. Well, yeah, it's good to know. You have spammers, but... That's an older problem. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just performance wise, right? You can do just operational things, right? So I, I think about it from a security point of view, right? Um, Flow was actually, well, I won't say created. Um, Cisco and the telcos first started thinking about putting Flow into routers in the 90s because they wanted to be able to take the old telco model forward and build their customers for internet usage, right? They were thinking, Billing in a packet world, right, where they were coming from the circuit world. So, you know, and then it's also quite quite useful just for operational things, you know, capacity planning, right? You know, I think I think malware all the time, but it's actually good for that as well. Um, you know, and who's coming to my, you know, my servers right from the outside? So who's talking to me? Is it, you know, Romania? Is it, you know, you know, DSL users? You know, so you know, who's using us? So these are really some of the you know the motivators. Uh, can you guys? Think of any any major classes that get not missed here. Um, major, okay. So the, yeah, so this this is really the motiv the, the motivators for why you might want to use flow. Um, all right, so let's blow through. I want to get to Arctic filter. We're skipping Linux. Uh, we're scope. We talked about that. Packing. We've talked about packing. We've actually talked about yeah. So I jumped the gun on a bunch of this stuff. That's fine. Um, there's it's actually laid out. This was done sort of before databases were. What they are today, so it's all file structure stuff, um, which surprisingly still works pretty well. Um, tool chain, um, yeah. So Silk likes to work in binary. Keep stuff in binary records as long as you can. Part of cut takes the binary records and turns them into text, and it's a lot slower when you do that. You know, you're tempted to because then you can run it into grep and friends, but it, keep them in binary as long as you can. Um, we've got visualization. Yes, this is the right slide. Um, this is the right slide. Um, yeah, so the, 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 this is this is where you would go to get more information on Silk. Although uh, Chris's book is probably a good place to start. Too. Um, this is obsolete. I think it'll still work. There's a new Silk. This is the one thing that's obsolete in here. Maps it tells you about the sensors. I think it's now like RDB sensor info. Is that the new guy? Something like that. I haven't looked in a while. It's not, it's not, it's not critical. Um, file info tells you, you know, what's if you have a RW. Silk files are historically typically called RW or, or raw files for just you know reasons that are lost to me. Um, but RW file info just basically tells you what it knows about the format of the file, the size, the number of records, that sort of stuff. Oh, and also it tells you what command was used to create the bottom here. It tells you what command was used to create the file. That's actually very useful. So, so if, you, if, if, you do, if you do some analysis and three months later, you know, you come back to your own analysis and you're like, how did I do this? What <laughs> command did I run? It's in the file. It and tells you. Uh, <laughs> it saves your bacon. Yes. It saves your bacon. Um, what what you did and why did it? All right. So cut, right? Uh, cut is a tool that basically takes the silk records primarily from RW filter and, and prints them out for you. You've been looking at cut output. Most of what we've seen is RW cut output. Um, yeah, so there's all these fields and there's more, like country code and all kinds of things. 
Um, you can tell it uh, the number of records to use. Okay, so here's um, RDB cut. You know, so if you have a raw, let's say you've run an RDB filter before, saved it in, in the raw file, right? You could say, show me the first 20 records and fields one through seven and nine, which is going to be the five tuple and a couple others. Um, so, yeah, from what you said earlier, how do you determine the country code? Um, so that is, uh, we can we can have the MaxMind database, the public or, or the private if you have it, and it'll take the, I believe it takes the IP address and goes into um, MaxMind and correlates them at the time you're on the command. Okay. You have to set that up though. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, 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 that's not the fault. That's, that's not, not the fault. That's, that's not the fault. Um, okay, so this is just more, more stuff on RW Cut. Um, we're not doing exercises because we just don't have the time. Well, this would be the interesting yeah. stuff. Here. Why not? Yeah, why not? It's the VMs are up lots of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do this. We'll show them RW filter and then we'll run an exercise or two. Yeah. Okay, so RW filter is the Swiss Army knife of silk, right? So RW filter's job is to take records out of the repository. So they come in, they get stored in the repository. The job is, I want to see stuff from last week, you know, that was on port 80, um, that had flag, a SIN flag, but not the, you know... You know, RW filter lets you say all that stuff. Um, so that's really what it does. The um, yeah, so it takes files from the repository. We're going to skip plugins, compression. We can skip that. Um, yeah, it's, you can send the output, and, and again, it's it's very much in the Unix type model. So RW filter just reads from wherever you tell it to read, and by default, it just well, no, it really writes the stuff. Usually, you send it to standard out into a file. Um, yeah. Okay that. So here's what an RW filter command will look like, or one might look like. You tell it a start date, and this tells it, you know, which which files you want to look at, the end date, that's, op, you know, optional. Um, I, in this case, I want to look at only the in files. I want to look at all the protocols. Uh, zero dash would be a shorthand for that. And you say pass. So uh, a key idea in RW filter is pass and fail. Right, so you're partitioning, I believe that's the right word, partitioning, right? Um, you're partitioning the, the records that come in into pass and fail. In this case, we're saying write all the passing records to this file. I could have said std out, in which case it would have gone, it would have gone the written binary records to standard out. I put a pipe, Unix pipe command here with an RW cut, and it will take the binary off the pipe, write those wonderful text records that you've got, and that's the basic thing. At this point, why don't we try that? If you, you want to give the file name, I presume, is it a file to read? You just did. So that is, you, that, you're, you're, you're writing to that file. Right, what are you reading? That, so it also, um, it's filtered set up to pull back from the repository. Yeah, so it knows, based on this, to, to go out to the repository and look for records of type in, because they're going to be in a different part of the directory tree, right? And so it's going to write those guys out. It's going to read those guys and write that. So let's, let's do one. On the, that's part of the mistake. It's where you read it. Where you read it. Okay. I, I, I have to, to set it up file. separately so I don't have it. Yeah, if you want to give it a file name, then that goes right after the RW filter. Okay. And it's important to put it right after the RW filter because if you put it anywhere else, it doesn't work. Can you flip start the sensor around? Um, I, think, I don't think it's it about Syntax is pretty except. open as long as you have the, the the necessary fields. Like if you put a start date and don't put an end date, yes. and you don't specify the hour, it just it does the whole thing. And so that, that was my expression is that the, the value after the colon is the hour because the one before that is the yeah. day, right? It's colon or T, either one. Yes. Okay, I got you. So there, uh, there's no many even though it looks like hours. Yeah. Right. So okay. here is here is just it just happens to be the last command I read when or read, ran when I was when I was playing a little bit earlier. Um, the data set that we have in here, yeah, the the U.S. Military Academies have an exercise where you know West Point and all, all their friends get together once a year and do a red team blue team exercise. The data that we have on this CD is the silk. For, they distributed PCAPs publicly, and you can still get them from that. We took those PCAPs, turned them. There's there's a command that will a command set of commands that will turn those into silk records. And so what what you have on this CD right is the 2009 CDX, you know, the red team blue team thing that West Point and friends did. 
right? You have that data. So the dates here are going to be basically, you know, right around April 20, you know, 2009. So if you're going to do do anything with this CD, you know, you have to basically you know, look at April 2009. So what we've got here is an RW filter command. I'm saying in this case, um, I want to look at protocol. I said six dash. So six is just going to give me TCP. I'm going to go on that day. Uh, let's just say that I only want the inbound records. I want the first ten of them, and I'm going to pass the, the binary records that match to standard out. Right? I'm going to pipe that to RW cut, and I'm just going to look at the first. Did I just mess up my thing? Eight fields. Yeah. I'm going to look at the first eight fields, and that gives me, what does that give me? So that gives me some inbound records. It looks like there's DNS. Um, I'm not sure what that high port stuff is. More DNS coming in, one packet. Okay, so that's not very interesting. Um, let's just take a look at what the outbound stuff was doing. Okay. Well, that was a little bit longer. So outbound. Again, we're seeing DNS. Now, what are we not seeing in here and why? What are we not seeing? Because I just said I want um, in and out. What, what's the most common type of traffic here in web and out web? On most network? What? In web and out web. In web and out web. Why am I not seeing any port 80 or 443 stuff here? You didn't specify. I didn't specify it. So, so all we're seeing here is the DNS stuff. So. Um, let's just. Oh, and by the way, this is this is TCP on yeah, 53. So you know this may or may not be a good thing, right? If we're doing newer TCP, the, the what is it? Some, some of the newer TCP, some of the newer um, DNS stuff, this might make sense. But normally, you would expect the the, the, um, the the DNS stuff to be on UDP, not you know. So let's just take a quick look at that. Um, let's just say um, 17, right? 17 is going to be UDP. This should look different. Okay, so there's that. Um, but if I say protocol six, I think you're starting to get the idea. Or you know, it's something uh, out, or we say out web. Um, you can do out and out web. Yeah, I'll just do this. Okay. So now we should just be seeing stuff that one one of the protocol, one of the ports is going to be a standard web port. Then you can see the flags and all that. So that's that. Um, Have to have at least one filter. The ones that are up there, you don't have to use those particular ones, but you do have to use at least one. Yeah, there are what are called, uh, this is deeper than we're going to get, but there are what are called selection and partitioning commands as part of the, the RW filter. I believe the selection ones really say which files out of the repository am I going to look at, and the, and the partitioning ones then say, you know, okay, within these. I may, I may have that backwards. I think that's right, though. And the way I always do it, tell me if this is not a good way, let us tell everybody, you have to have an input, you have to have partition things, and you have to have an output. So the input is what you want to look at, partitioning is what you want to filter out of it, and output is how you want to view it. All right, so, you have to have so we're, we're over the time I wanted to go. I want to at least show you the, the, the stats command, and then, you know, we may call it good. Um, selection. Um, Partitioning, right? We talked about that. More stuff. Uh, uh, filtering, filtering, blacklists, whitelists, building sets. What is this? Up. Exercise. Okay. Oh, sets. Um, you can build these binary set files. So if you had a blacklist, you can you can take the list of IP addresses, turn them into what's called a set file, and then rather than typing like huge lists of, of you know addresses one by one on a filter command. Um, and these, I don't know what they did, but they're like blazingly fast. Like you know, like. I don't know if they're bit vectors or what, but they're blazingly fast. Yeah, and I've seen, operation, yeah, I've seen people use these here. use these without even thinking about doing self records. If you just want to do, you know, union set or whatever, the RWB set stuff works fast. Um, <coughs> partitioning, I just want to get to the sort stuff. Filter, 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 Ten Commandments. Uh, Okay, yeah, counting stats. You, you can count things, you can do time series, you can do top 10 things. Um, yeah, so I like the stats. So counting, 
exercise, counting. Right, so stats, we'll just get to the example of it, and then we'll call it good. Um, okay, so what are we doing in this command? We're going to click the thing. So, okay, we're filtering. Okay, what is this? So, someone tell me what this thing is. It's the raw binary output file from some other round. Or yeah, filter. So you've saved that. Okay. Um, so here we're actually using, uh, I think this is a partition, partitioning one. So we're actually taking all of those, and this is actually going to do filter, filtering based on the time in the records. And then this is just going to pass everything standard out, right? We're using the little, the little backslash thing to make it look nice to, to follow one command. Then stats, you're basically, I think, specifying your key here. So you, the, 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 the key that you're going to use is the source address. You're going to, the value then is going to be the bytes. And I, I want the top 10. So this is going to, I think, give me like a top 10 count of the source addresses. So let's see if that's right. Um, so you've got a bunch of addresses, right? It's going to give you the, the top, yeah, so this is going to be a top 10 of the bytes. So these are the top 10 talkers by bytes. And then it just gives you, you know, percentages and whatnot. So stats, I think, is your friend. Count and unique are, all, are also your friends. Um, I think with that, I'm over an hour. And, you know, I can keep going for a long time. Um, but I think, you know, given that I'm at an hour, I'll stop unless, unless people are screaming in the aisles for, like, more. And I'll add a couple of, <laughs> I'll add a couple of uh, great resources. I know, first of all, if you're anything like, like me, you're probably like, like John or David, you want to take this home and go play with it now. Um, so there, the good thing about Silk is it's probably one of the most accessible tools you'll find. The documentation is amazing. It has basically a small army behind it, supporting it and evangelizing it and doing very good things. So the easiest ways, I think, to get involved are one is you have this new live CD, and that's one way. But if you want to set it up at home, yeah. 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 Um, the other thing is uh, CERT has some really good guides. They have a thing called the Analyst Handbook, which is amazing. It's you know, how to use it. As far as setting it up, they have, um, they have a thing called Silk on a Box. So if you just Google Silk on a Box and then CERT. They have guides for a couple different operating systems. I know Ubuntu, 204, maybe Red Hat, or about that. What? The Silk on a Box guides? Yeah. yeah. There's Ubuntu, there's Red Hat, I think. You can do almost any like going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so it's, yeah. Just, those are very step by step. Yeah, it's very self contained. It's, it's step by step. Everything you need to do to get it up and running on one single box. Beyond that, uh, if, you, if you're using Security Onion, um, Jason and I wrote a guide. So I have security running it. That's that's all that stuff for fuck on the generated. I have security onion. I have also some running in the background. Okay. That's 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 we're using it. Uh, but yeah. it's basically it's it's, <laughs> it's very similar to Silk on a Box, but it's security onion centric and shows you how to get all the data into the, the right folder so it's consistent with other things like security onion. Yeah. Beyond that, we're actually uh, I've written a guide. I've not put it out yet on how to install it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, <laughs> it doesn't need a lot of power. You can uh, there was some you can collect all kinds of flows on a Raspberry Pi. We had that's a great. so comes we had a sensor for less than a hundred dollars uh, presentation. So you can if you're you can do Raspberry Pi them and that that's one that's more in a processing yeah, people. Yeah. SD card, you're good to go. Yeah, well, I, have, I have two guys. One's one silk on it, and one is called I call it Raspberry Pig. It's uh, snort on it okay. uh, with silk. And so it's, it's the same type of deal. Uh, very limited rule set, obviously. Where's those guys? Uh, it's written. I just need to publish it. Uh, we'll like flow on for in my way of doing it. That said, it's super accessible, really easy to use. Um, as you can tell from my hauling from the back, I'm pretty big still guy. And I'm always trying to evangelize it. And if I can only have one tool on a desert island to defend the network, it would be still standard. Yeah. Yeah. So for the for the small organizations and the home gamers, is YAF really the only option for getting the flows? Uh, Anything that you can use to get a PCAP, YAP yes. can turn the PCAP into a flow. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's that pro. Okay. Um, but it's not quite as remodeled. Yes, yes, I've been free too. Yeah, well, I've, I've just been surprised with some of the Cisco gear. Like, even some of the mid size switches don't do that flow. Um, there really needs to be a router. Or like yeah. 65 miles. I was going to say, like, like, not even just a router, but a core or a distribution layer router. I use a, 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 a CWRT router, and I just put two routing tables in and send them to my security onion. Well, in general, a lot of the times you're going to want to collect them on the, yeah. on the router anyway, what I've seen. Yeah. 
people are wanting to collect it at that point. Yeah, yeah. I don't see a lot of people actually collecting it from switches. Uh, but you're saying you're just your regular Netgear wireless yeah, job to uh, generate flows? I have a Buffalo DDWRT router and I just, uh, I just yeah, put, so. oh, you just put two T commands in and just, um, I just special because it, because you, so, you, you can command. specify the IP, right? Um, right on the security onion, even though, even though the automatic setup tries to tell you to run it in, uh, uh it's, it's whatever, uh, yeah. uh wow. John Blank. Um, but you know what I mean? Master or? Yeah, yeah. It, it, like it's supposed to be an open source so collects all, right? As, yeah. a, as a port, a spam port, but you can just, uh, you can actually sign an IP, run a dash G command, and then just basically as long as it's static, it will, it will collect. That's what the we you all. Know, that's what the one of the flow on presentations. If you look at them, it's uh, how about flow sensor for less than hundred dollars. Actually, those two key commands that were needed to be are in the okay. presentation. And that hundred dollars for that for that system is actually not only just the collector, it's actually for a generator too. Or it's like a tap and everything. Yeah, your sensor yeah. and your yeah. That's right. a whole sensor and a, so it's a Raspberry Pi and a, and a router that you can do it all for less than hundred dollars. And, and that actually, and as long as you have the storage aggregation, you can do that for a small network. Yeah, size. <clears throat> NFS mount some behemoth and off you go. Well, yeah, you don't even need a ton of space. <laughs> no, because oh. everything's oh, right, because you're compressing. 13 bit binary. Um, yeah. you, actually, the R, when you run an RW command, you write out and cut. When you need to cut, that's actually bigger than what, before. What was the statistic we came up with? Because we just spent a lot of time when we were writing the book trying to come up with a statistic for, you know, if he had the first one, data size, you know, what is, what's the comparative data size? It was like 0.0026 or something like that. It's, yeah, it's extreme. And it, it really varies depending yeah. upon, you know, if you have a lot of small flows, like a lot of user traffic. Right. On, it really varies. So you're talking yeah. about collecting everything versus, uh, like, you know, in the data comparison of, like, you know, PCAP versus that flow or something like that. Well, oh. Usually when you're collecting PCAP, it's like, you don't click 443, you don't click, you know, 22, you don't click any of that anyways. But, you know, with this, you are just clicking everything, and it's still, I mean, yeah. it's not even a comparable, I mean, the stat is almost ridiculous to even well, well, talk about it. Well, we, so did, we, we ended up cutting it from the book. It was a little too weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so tiny. It was a meaningless. And, uh, yeah. we have a, <laughs> help, <laughs> online, we have a help, <laughs> help email. Go ahead and yeah, uh, throw us help requests. Uh, the development team will answer us pretty much every day. So, um, we have no problem. Yeah, getting it configured or setting it up, uh, no problem. Instead of getting you after work, we'll just uh, send us a problem. And they're uh, pretty quick on responses. And while I'm saying up here, I guess I'll plug the book, Apply Network Security Monitoring is the book that uh, I wrote along with Jason and, and a couple other folks, and it has an entire sub chapter. Um, it covers basically a lot of the other things we're talking about here. Um, pretty good reference. Uh, I know a lot of people have written actual book-based content on, on Silk, so we have that out there. There's a whole chapter in it about, about using statistics, RDB stats, which is... It might as well be called the RDB stats know, chapter. RDB <laughs> filter is more a, um, more a, like, if you think of collection detection and analysis as separate processes, RDB filter is kind of the analysis tool, I think, and whereas something like RDB stats is the detection tool, where you're using it to actually detect the madness that you did while you're doing analysis on. Part of it with it. And it's a pretty powerful tool, and Jason and I personally call a lot of bad guys, the serious bad guys, and the... the Clowny bad guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, all using RW stats. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can do a lot of post processing <laughs> and still data to do uh, a lot of really neat visualizations and things like that as well. Uh, okay, that's progress. I've been wondering.